All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. It is 12 noon. If you're Eastern time, it's 11 a.m. If you're Central time, let's, uh, let's get going. We have a great presentation ready for you today. We're gonna be talking a little bit about the Fed. We're gonna talk about some small caps, large caps, and uh, some interesting things about the 13F filings. Can't wait for you to hear about that. And it's just in case you don't know what that is, those are the quarterly filings required by the, uh, the money managers, the big ones, uh, institutions that uh, they have to file. They, they say basically what they're trading and it'll give us uh, some good insight. So make sure you stick around and hear everything uh, about that. And uh, so we're gonna get started right away. We're gonna get started up here. Adam, if you wanna flip over to the slide with their contact information, I wanna make sure all of our uh, people in the audience have the opportunity to contact any of these great traders with any personal questions that you have about the market. They will get back to you. They're excellent at that. We've got this, we've got our new trader, Martin Tillier listed there. Make sure you jot that down as well. And then of course on their slides, you'll be able to get the information about them also. So let's go ahead and get started. Hey, Mark, hey, let's get started with you. How about that? And um, Adam, if you can go ahead and flip over to her slide, because you have, you have this great trade setup that's very, seems to be simple to use. It's this retirement setup. I know it's been so popular. In fact, I think you have to get going making some recordings on that today. So I want to hear from you first. You had some trades on Apple and uh, what was the other one? Square. I don't know if you can bring us up to date on this, this, mil this uh, retirement trade that you have for us. Yeah, um, I can. And I actually, and if you guys are good, I'll just share my screen. I'm just going to show you some charts, if that's good with everybody. Because uh, I kind of have to talk with, oh, no, we can't. Never mind, it won't let me. Well, I guess Adam's yeah, sharing. Um, so if you guys can look at charts then. I talk with charts, so I have a really hard time. Oh, there it is. Awesome, thank you. Stop my share, Marquette. What's that? <laughs> Well, you should share now. Okay. Okay, cool. So just, this is just how I look at charts and I, I just, I keep it super simple. And this whole retirement pattern, I take a lot of indicators and I, I put things together and I'm trying to find stocks that are moving with momentum, right? I'm trying to find a stock that's moving well, but then has also pulled back. So we're getting in at a decent price and not getting in when it's, you know, overvalued or at a, I, I, a new high, I think I mentioned this last time. I try to get them when they're a little bit undervalued. This was an interesting stock that I didn't mention earlier, uh, but it just came up on one of my scans and it's Billy Billy. And honestly, it's a Chinese stock. It's a social, I think a younger person, social media sort of a thing over there. I don't know anything about it other than that, but I like that it just set up that retirement pattern, which is basically what you see here where the stock has moved higher and it's had this pullback uh, right down to a, like a nice retracement setup area. So their options are well priced. This is something that's kind of on my watch list for you know a, a candidate here even today or early next week. But just kind of a crazy different stock that just set up that retirement pattern. But other things is as we talked about, um, something like Square is just. They've just got all of that, all that trend and all that momentum to, um, you know, that I'm looking for. And they set up their retirement pattern the other day. So this is already one that I'm in and just taking that momentum. Um, but I, I wouldn't do it now. I like it better at a lower level, closer to the moving averages. So just here's, I'm going to share, these are some different ones that came up on my scan. So I'm going to go a little bit in a weird place with the Billy Billy and then Tractor Supply, which I haven't seen this in a while. It was actually something I used to trade a while back and they came up again just this morning because they just threw that retirement pattern. So you can see it's a stock that's been in an uptrend, right? And they're, they've had a lot of momentum, a lot of buying pressure here. And that pullback yesterday was still really bullish indicators is what helps give us that retirement pattern. So today is that bounce up off of that retirement pattern that is kind of that entry that I look for. So it's kind of fun to find things, I think on the pullback where you get in at a better price. Uh, another one is Peloton. And you hear a lot of talk about Peloton, you know, just with the, everybody staying at home and nobody can go to the gym and all of that. 
And uh, you can see here that they also had this big rally. This is on earnings, by the way, this gap up area to the 44 price point. That was all earnings. They had a little bigger push up beyond that just a bit. And they've spent the last week just kind of pulling back and retracing, but they still have real strong bullish indicators. So when you have that retirement pattern and you have bullish indicators and still all the momentum indicators in play, this is the kind of bounce also that I look for. So I have got, actually I've got two more. I'll just show you all. Of... Hey, and Marque, yeah. can you just briefly for our audience kind of define what that retirement uh, pattern trade is? Yeah, it's, you know, it really is just that idea of using the right indicators and finding a stock that's moving with some momentum. We want strength. I always look for trends or the beginning of a trend and it can be up or down. But right now we've got so much more strength out there in the markets in a lot of stocks that we're getting more of those setups on this, you know, on the bullish side of things. But it really is, I use uh, uh, things like ADX and Bollinger Bands and uh, cash flow accumulation that you see here, some volume, uh, moving averages, and I'm finding strong, you know, technical signals on all of those indicators. I want a stock that has started to show some trending behavior and then I wait for that pullback. So the retirement pattern is the pullback after all of the indicators have turned bullish in the case of Peloton or after all of the indicators have turned bearish and we have a downtrending stock. I don't even have a downtrending candidate right now because the markets are just too bullish. So I'm dealing with more of that bullish momentum. Here's another one. This might help maybe a little bit and sell my lines and things here. But if you look at Visa, right, just ticker symbol V, they haven't quite set up the retirement pattern, but they have all of the bullish indicators. And so when you look here, you can see they got overextended. Then they've spent the last two days starting to retrace. So this goes on a watch list for me as a stock that may be ready to throw that retirement pattern. Maybe not today, maybe. It might happen early next week, but it becomes more of a, a trading idea for me, let's say into probably next week where we will have that retirement pattern set up. And then if it bounces, then we'll have that entry. Um, let me back the chart up. So I'm just back, moving back here. So this candle right here was May 14th. So on the 13th, was another example right here where my mouse is, that's, an, that's the retirement pattern. So at that point, we had bullish indicators across the board, we just, we had a rally. So we've got all the strength and all the indicators that I look at and the candle patterns. It just pulls back and retraces, sets up the retirement pattern, and then you have an entry that next day. And either on the day of the retirement pattern or the following day, kind of depending. And then ideally it's going to look, you know, something like this is what we're hoping for. We get that, we get that momentum continuation basically. And so where Visa is now still a little bit overextended, but now I have them on my list for, you know, again, if they do set up that retirement pattern again, which they often will, because they often set up again and again and again over time. So the next time Visa does that, then I'll, you know, same thing that it did back here a week ago or so, a couple of weeks ago, then I'll try to grab that and buy some calls on the next bounce or buy stock if you're just a stock trader, right? So that's kind of it. I don't know if that's helpful, but those are the things that I'm looking at. And it's just that combination of all the indicators, finding a momentum stock in a strong trend, either up or down, and then just being patient and waiting for the trade to come back, let it settle down a little bit where we can get a better price point. Excellent. And then Marque, just briefly, that's how you get in. How do you get out? How do you know when to get out? So you can, I, I look for two things, either a longer trending trade, which could be you're in the trade for weeks, uh, or a, a shorter swing trade. So a lot of times with the swing trade, I'm looking for a stock breaking out to a new high, like what we had over here just this week on Visa, they broke out to a new high. And then I start raising my targets to get out. So all it has to do, break out to a new high, and then every day I'm raising my stops up. So in this, this and that's you know a shorter swing trade, right? So I do swing trading or trend trading. And on this one, the swing trade exit on Visa was hit on the 21st, so just yesterday. And if, um, if you 
so I trade options a lot. So if I buy a week or two of time, it's always going to be a swing trade. Uh, and sometimes they'll do a little bit of that and then a longer trending trade. I would actually prefer to use a moving average as a stop. So then I'd be in the trade for weeks and just let it run until it breaks an average usually. Excellent. Great. Thanks for that thorough explanation. And, you know, all of you that are online listening, if you want some more information, go to her website. She has a great detail there and also just get in touch with her. It's a great pattern to follow. And Mark, hey, thanks for being with us. I know you've got a busy day of some recordings. So everyone out there listening, look forward to those recordings coming out soon. So. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Sorry to run, but you guys have a great Memorial Day weekend. Uh, thanks to anybody who served. We appreciate all of that. And you guys, I will catch you next week then. Great. Thanks, Mark. Great. Thanks, Mark. Hey. Thank you, all Mark right, Hay. Adam. If you have the projection and can bring that back up again, uh, we have a new special guest here and uh, you're going to really enjoy listening to him. His name is Martin Tillier and he's so special. He had to be masked today. He didn't come in on video. We're going to forgive you for that, Martin, but next time you got to show your face. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding on that. But uh, but Martin, you can read a little bit about him. He has a tremendous amount of experience. The, thing that speaks volumes is the fact that he has traded for a living for 40 years. So he comes with great experience, not only on the kind of equity side, but really on the Forex side and in the energy markets. He knows it all. And he's been around the world, England, Japan, Russia, Pol Poland, and the US. Now, um, and he got started there in London. You're gonna hear his wonderful accent that we love here in the US. And, uh, but you know, he came to the US by way of a very sad event. And that is September 11th, uh, 2001. His brother-in-law was in the first tower that was struck and uh, he and his wife immediately made the decision to move back to the States and support the family here. And uh, uh, we just, uh, you know, when I read that story, Martin, it just was, it was very touching and a great, uh, great experience of, uh, uh, to share with all of us. So, um, and then when Martin came to the US, he got started on Wall Street here and was working with one of the big brokerage firms until he was told that his strategies were too risky for you and me, you know, the retail trader, even though those same strategies were being played out in the trading rooms where he has all of his experience and they were based on risk management. So we love having Martin here. And uh, Martin, if you are ready to go, I wanna hear from you since, since you were really at the last kind of this not last couple of 20 years or so of your career, really been in the energy markets and that's been all over the news. Tell us as retail traders, how, how do we need to look at these markets? Is, are there opportunities? Should we stay away? And why, what are your long-term strategies and, and, and explain why you feel the way that you do. So Martin, take it away. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks for the great intro. I feel like I'm really smart now. I don't know. Um, I don't want to, you know, normally when I'm new to something, I would go through who I am and where I come from and everything else. But I think Celeste has already done that really well. Just one personal note um, as we're coming up to Memorial Day, uh, thoughts and prayers for my oldest son, Ben, who's currently on deployment in the Middle East with the U.S. Army. So just if you could keep him in, your, keep him in mind. Um, that's not my specialty, though, military stuff. At the moment, it tends towards the energy, and, it, and it's just a fascinating market right now. Every market is interesting at the moment because of the volatility we've seen, but energy probably more than any other. And, and what you're hearing all the time, if you're kind of listening, paying attention is a whole bunch of people saying that this coronavirus thing, all the shutdown, everything, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. This will mark the end of oil, the end of big energy. I think I first heard that back in the 1970s uh, when the phrase peak oil was popular, you know, and we were supposed to all believe that, you know, oil was a finite resource in the earth and we could only get so much of it out and demand was still increasing and that couldn't go on forever and it was all going to change. And all of the arguments against oil and fossil fuels in general make perfect sense. And you may agree with them or disagree with them or whatever. It doesn't matter from a, from a trader's perspective, from an investor's perspective, you have to weigh them just logically and outside of the politics of it. 
and they all make sense, but they seem to always not allow for human innovation. And so we keep keep on going and oil keeps on going and it keeps on being important and demand keeps on increasing. And so I don't really see that changing. And to be honest, the more I hear, you know, the I don't want to single people out, but the Kramers of this world shouting and waving their arms around and saying that, you know, it's the death of oil and it's an uninvestable sector, the more interested I become in it because it's only when everybody hates something that there's real opportunity in it. And that's, you know, we, anybody who's ever traded kind of knows that. And, and that, you know, so there are, there is opportunity. I mean, we've already seen it with the bounce back in crude, you know, we, we in negative territory for a while, unheard of stuff. And yet we're back up above $30 a barrel just a few weeks later. It's, it's not going away. And in fact, the longer term opportunities in, in oil stocks, you know, I know you're going to talk about the Fed later, but it's kind of related to the whole Fed thing. You know, the mechanics of the way the Fed did QE and is now doing its buying programs and everything else, basically what happens is they decide to go out and buy something from financial institutions and they just create a credit in that institution's account with them to pay for what they buy. That's new money out there being handed to financial institutions. And they go out and reinvest it. So you, and, and that's happening all over the world. It's not just the Fed right now. As every central bank tries to counter this huge recession that we've kind of engineered for ourselves. So when you, when you take all that into account, what you've got, and, and in, at the same time, you have the IPO market slowing right down because of market conditions, and you have bankruptcies going on in certain sectors and in certain places. So what you've got is an ever increasing pool of money chasing an ever decreasing pool of paper. What does that mean? It means prices go up, right? And, and even though energy is a natural place for people to ignore on the initial push and, you know, big tech and various other things have a lot more appeal, <clears throat> eventually that dynamic broke the laggards. That's the long-term and big picture. That's the move that I'm looking to right now. That doesn't mean though that everything is, is going to be investable. There are problems in the oil patch. You can't get away from that. And they're huge. I mean, I, I just think that there is a, um, you just have to be sensible about it. You know, if you look at some of the smaller cap energy companies with maybe weaker balance sheets, they are going to have problems and they're going to have problems based on not just where the price of oil is right now, but the valuation of the, of the land leases and the, in, in the, um, under, undeveloped land and whatever that they use as security for their loans. So you have to be careful. You, as, as a trader, I'm sure all of you are already aware, the one thing that you want to avoid is putting yourself in a position where your downside is total loss. That makes no sense at all. And there are, situ there are some places in the, in the energy sector where that's a very real possibility right now. So I'm not saying you should wade in and be buying XLE or you know some generic thing and just hope that, and, but I'm just saying that in some areas, there are some great longer term opportunities. And as somebody just put in the chat thing, it's hard to ignore the kind of yields that you're looking at as well. I mean, I, you know, back, we started um, the Deep Earth Publishing Newsletter a few months ago to kind of try and get some of this message out to people. And one of the first trades I suggested at that time was to buy Royal Dutch Shell in when it was kind of in the, I think it was just about to break $20 on the way back up again. And that, you know, there are opportunities for quick profits. Like now that was 50% in a week or something. There are opportunities for great profits like that. But I'm talking more here about longer term, um, I mean, really quite seriously long term basis of your portfolio type trades. And, and for that, I think you, you need to concentrate on larger cap, the, the, the traditional big multinational diversified oil firms. Size is an advantage here because the balance sheet is stronger and they have, these are companies, when I talked about Roll Dutch Show, I talked about the fact that that's a company that survived the Great Depression, two world wars, various oil shocks, Black Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, whatever you want to call it, all sorts of disruptions of the market and they've survived and continued. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, you're looking for something that would have, that has resilience. And so I like that, you know, I like the big companies, but I also think you need to see some kind of diversification and, pre and I have a preference right now for downstream. Those of you that aren't familiar with the energy markets, when we talk about downstream as opposed to upstream, upstream 
oil companies are those involved in exploration and production. The, the wildcatters, if you like, the people that go out, buy land, drill, and actually get the oil out of the earth. The downstream is the refining and retail side of the business that sell gasoline and, and actually refine. The reason I prefer it is because there is some protection on the on the downstream side because as price if prices fall and not necessarily collapse like they did a month or so ago but if they fall in a more gradual sense what happens is something called the crack spread increases and what that is it's the difference between crude oil and the refined products increases because your input price of crude becomes lower and so these are companies that can do well even if oil does turn tail again which i don't think is going to happen immediately but but if it was about to you know if it starts to they, they're still going to be okay. So I think you want to look for that. So I'm, I'm talking about, you know, big multinationals, as I say, I mean, I, I still, I'm not so much, Royal Dutch Shell, you know, they, they made a bigger cut to their dividend than I expected. It's still a healthy yield. But so, but I mean, there are others out there on the international front, you know, BP, Total, SA, maybe, um, and domestically, something like Chevron, CVX, um, but then more on the downstream side, maybe Marathon Petroleum, MPC, or Philips 66, PSX. Those are the kind of companies that I'm looking to, it's more a question of owning for, for, for my base portfolio than it is just individual trades. I'm not gonna give any individual immediate trades right now because my, my dealer and background means that everything I do is super time sensitive. Um, and so it's kind of hard for me to say, hey, maybe you should consider this at some point in the future. But we do, we are in the process of launching a service called uh, Energy Income Trader that will be much more on those short term individual trades. But on that subject, I do want to just, um, I do just want to kind of talk a bit about trading strategy in these kind of markets, because we can all pick individuals and whatever, but unless you have a base, unless you make an adjustment to your basic strategy to suit the kind of volatility we're seeing, you're going to get hurt. And what do I mean by that? Well, my, my natural tendency, and you may have gathered from what I said at the beginning about, you know, when all the talking heads are down on something, I, it makes me look at it. I, my, my, I was, by training and nature, I tend to be a little contrarian in my trading style normally. Um, but at times like this, no. Um, I will, I, I'm much more attracted to momentum because every move becomes exaggerated and trying to pick tops and bottoms is really hard when the market seems to be paying no attention to logical levels, whether that's logical from a technical perspective or a fundamental perspective, they don't really matter at the moment. Everything's following through with massive amounts. So you need to switch to a more momentum driven style of trading if you're naturally contrarian. And there's another advantage to that too, which is that if you do that, you can set your stops a lot tighter um, than you could do with a, a, a contrarian style. If you're trying to pick the, the bottom of a move down, let's say, and, and you know that things are getting exaggerated, obviously to have a chance in that trade, you have to set your stop further away. Now basic position management and risk management means that you need to do that, but it also means that because you're setting further away, your positions need to be smaller but you've still got expanded risk on the downside. If you're going into a momentum trade, every trade is based on a set of fundamental assumptions, you know, basic assumptions when you take it. And when you get out of a trade it should really be when that assumption is proven wrong. And if you're going into momentum trade, the minute that thing turns down and ticks down for, you know, a, just a few times, your assumptions wrong. So your stops can be really tight to your entry position relatively, which means that your position size can be relatively larger. I still think in volatility, you need to cut down on position size a little bit, but, but they can be a lot larger than if you're trying to do a, make a contrarian trade, right? So that it's, so momentum then allows you to set slightly tighter stops during volatile times or much tighter stops, which is beneficial. The, uh, it, it, the thing about stops though, and, and I know this is probably teaching grandma to suck eggs as we say in England, but stops only work if you stick to them. So the other big key, well, the big key to trading generally, but certainly in times of volatility is discipline. 
if you every time your your trade approaches your stop it kind of looks like well, yeah, well it's kind of slowing down well that's why you put your stop there in the first place right and so people tend to think well it's kind of slowing down maybe i should just uh, get a little bit more and drop my stop a little bit that's a recipe for disaster and uh, you know it, you, you want to avoid that at all costs so it's important at any time but when things are flying around, it's even more important that you just stick to where your original stop loss was. It was put there when you were thinking clearly, logically, before the emotion of actually having a position kicked in, and just stick to it. You know, really simple advice, but worth re-saying at times like this. Right. So, so basically, I, I, I tend to switch more towards momentum-based trades, and. I tr and I, I double down on being disciplined about sticking with stops. Um, okay, so I'm seeing a couple of things pop up in the chat and I'm gonna try and answer them as I go along. So uh, my favorite momentum indicator, um, I, I, I mean, I use, I, I, I like MA crossovers. Um, it's simple and it's logical, right? Um, if if short-term momentum is powerful enough to cross over long term, then you have a move. Um, and, and I don't necessarily go in for any kind of fancy reads on MACD or anything like that. It's fairly straightforward. It's like those crossover points are important and they and they work short term for intraday stuff and they work longer term for swing trades. So I, you know, that's that's the number one thing really. And it's yeah, I think we're really going to have to have you back on, Martin, to really go into this. You know, more of your setups on your momentum trading, if you don't mind uh, uh, sharing that with us. So would love sure. to have you back. And also I, I had a question for you too. When you talk about kind of long-term and you're looking at, you know, potential investment opportunities in the uh, energy markets, what do you consider to be long-term? How long do you think you would hold something at this good buy down here? How long is a piece of string? Um, I, it really, that's a, such a tough question to answer. It, one of the other th adjustments that I was taught to make, and, and bear in mind, as I say, when I started in a dealing room all those years ago, I was surrounded by veterans who taught me a lot of stuff that is still relevant today. And and one of those was that you basically switch. I mean, I, I noticed Mark A talking about it as well, about momentum-based trades and about this as a, start, as a way of doing things, which is that you, you use a lot more trailing stops uh, in these kind of markets because you're really it's really hard to say when a move is ended. Um, you know, I don't think anybody foresaw when, when oil dipped back down towards, you know, crude dipped back down towards 10 bucks a couple of weeks ago. I don't think anybody foresaw the next week, you know, 150% increase back up to 25 over the next week. You may have thought it was going to bounce from there. And I actually did, but, but I didn't foresee it going that far. So you really have to use trailers to, to give yourself a chance. Um, when I'm talking about long-term trades, for me, I, it, there's, I mean, I, I work with traders and investors, and from an investment perspective, you know, obviously you're you're measuring things in months, if not years. Um, but from a trading perspective, long-term, I'm talking probably up to three to six months in this case. You know, um, these are real longer-term swing trades Excellent. that I'm talking about in the in those big energy companies because there's still that negativity around that's going to hold it down for a while but eventually the fundamental dynamics and in the in the pressure from the fed i mean they are going to catch up great well thank you martin that was a lot of excellent information i think we definitely need to have martin back what do you all think so uh, a lot to chew on the recording will be available you can go back and listen to <laughs> that from Martin and then uh, Martin, we want you to come back sometime and uh, expand on all of those things, okay? Definitely. So great. And next up we have Roger. And of course, Roger always comes with fantastic trade ideas. I mean, you could just make a living off of those. Uh, talk about a retirement strategy, just you know, listening to Roger every week here uh, with oh, his don't, trades. Don't give, me, don't give me any alternative ideas, Celeste. <laughs> Okay, I'll try it on too. But I do have to point out, you know, Roger, he shares this great information freely. And in fact, on one of my computer screens behind me, Roger, I have an article that you wrote about a year ago on swing trading. And can you make a living off of that? And I keep it posted in some of my files and go back to it periodically because it wanted to talk about, you know, having to, you know, that you compete with millions of people out there and you're, you've got to be consistent. And uh, 
working on an accuracy rate. And I know you have that in a lot of your trading styles. And I know you launched one even just this week. But okay, we're here. We got our pen and paper ready to go. What do you have for us? Thank you. I was about to say, please take a piece of pen and paper. It'll make this a lot more fruitful. And I'll, I'll save the best for last. I'll talk about the 13F filings. And I'll, I know we're, we, I'll try to make this as fast as possible. I know other people are, are going to go. So first thing, first thing is profiting from two electronic payment stocks. Electronic payments, obviously with COVID-19 and so forth, things are not getting any better. We're having more processes. And I didn't want to talk about the ones that everyone knows about, like SquarePay and PayPal. I know Marques did a great job talking about that. So I'll talk about two that are kind of under the radar right now. The first one is Copa Software. Ticker symbol is C-O-U-P. And what I like about this stock is the fact that it provides um, it, it provides um, soft... Uh, cloud-based management for companies like Enterprise, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Hertz Rent-A-Car, where you have thousands of different shops, hundreds of cars, and everybody's all tuned into one portal. So it's for companies that don't have millions of different services, but only have one service, but they, there's so much need for that service. So rent-a-cars, airlines, so forth and so forth. It's a very specialized niche. Um, they're doing very, very well. They got nine strong buy recommendations, four positive earnings surprises. Their stock has, the, the company has been growing tremendously, three-year growth of 514%. Very, very promising stock. The next one and final one for this, for the electronic payments is Global Payments, ticker symbol GPN. What they're doing, what's really cool about them is they're doing what Apple Pay is good for. They specialize in what is called NFC, near field communication. It's, 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 um, it's a driving force in transactions all over the world right now. Um, they've added 13 million accounts in just the first quarter of 2020. They have 53 in market cap and get this, 19 buy recommendations, which tells me there's going to be a lot of institutional sponsorship following this stock. So that's, that's electronic payments. Next is three stocks on the chopping block, all right? So these are three stocks that I think will disappear permanently. They are good shorting opportunities. They're good stocks to liquidate if you have them, or they're just good stocks to stay away from. And I go, again, I'll go through it pretty quickly. Chesapeake Energy, ticker symbol CHP, CHK, excuse me. They just filed a 10Q form alerting the SEC that they may not be in business. They have doubts about their ability to go forward. That's the company saying this. So it, it's not looking pretty. They're having difficulty with liquidity and financial obligations over the next 12 months. That's a public statement that they filed with the government. Okay. They've got assets of 1.8 billion, but they've got liabilities of 2.26 billion. It's not good. I don't think they're going to make it and they've been losing money for five years straight. So that's the first one. Uh, again, ticker symbol CHK. Next one, Hertz Rent-A-Car. Everybody knows Hertz Rent-A-Car. Remember those OJ Simpson commercials about 25 years? Yeah. Well, I don't think Hertz is going to be around much longer. They just replaced their CEO to avoid bankruptcy. Um, they filed, they've been filing debt obligation notices. They're having difficulty paying their obligations. The stock went from $120, it's now $3. And this is not a stock you wanna, you wanna buy on a bounce. This is a stock you wanna forget about or sell. Finally, the last one, and this stock I actually managed, uh, mentioned a few, a few weeks ago, it's Dave & Buster's, ticker symbol play, P-L-A-Y. People are not playing pool right now. People are not going out playing video games. People are not going out right now. This stock, it does very well when the economy is rocking and rolling. You need to have a lot of discretionary income. There's no discretionary income right now. It has 10 hold recommendations, and at three years, it's got a negative 80% earnings. The stock is not doing well. Also, it never bounced from the March-April freefall that we've had. Also, its short interest is increasing, and it's not seeing any buying insiders, any insiders buying, even at these levels. So there's every sign that these three stocks will not be around anymore. A lot of changes in the economy, aren't there? That's yeah. A different the, world coming out. Thanks for pointing those areas out to us, Roger. 
Yeah. Now I know you asked for a couple of small cap stocks. These are small float. They're not penny stocks, but these are small stocks. And we just had earnings. These stocks really, really surprised everybody in a positive way. And first one is called ServiceNow, ticker symbol N-O-W. And I'll also talk about this company, N-O-W, in a few minutes when I talk about the 13 Fs. Um, they do digital workflows. Digital flow. Let me give you some numbers. Company reported 30% customer growth in the first quarter, 50% contract growth, 30% revenue growth, all in the first quarter. They've grown 1,400% in the last five years. They have 15 buy recommendations right now, and the stock is looking good. Next one, and this is a good one too. A lot of people actually know about this one. I was surprised. It's EverQuote, dominating online insurance. A lot of people are buying insurance via online right now. They're, the stock rose 600% last year. It's up over 80% this year in, alone. Revenue is up 56%. And the stock is the largest insurance marketplace out there. It has five strong buy recommendations. And I like it very much. Very interesting. But, but here's the best part. Now, this is cool. I think you guys are going to love this. Ticker symbol is E-V-E-R. E-V-E-R. Great now, I'll, information. I, Keep it going, Roger. Oh, this is the last part, but I think you guys will really love this, okay? So there is a form called 13F that any fund that has more than $100 million in assets has to report. Basically, a good-sized fund. What I did was they, they just reported on the 15th, so about – you know, a week ago. And uh, I look at these importantly, but what I wanted to do this time, I knew this was going to be interesting. So what I did was I took the 20 best performers over the last 45 days. Okay. I didn't just take the biggest ones. I took the best performers and then I, I looked at all of them at their top five stocks. And I looked to see which five stocks they all have. And I listed them for you in the order of most to least. And I, then I did it into two parts, holdings and accumulation. Now, most of these are not surprises, but there's a few in here that are just complete and utter surprises. So let me go through this for you, but you're going to love this, okay? So this is out of top 20, top 20. 11, Amazon, not a surprise, right? right. Facebook. So far, no surprises. Microsoft, Alibaba, Netflix, Google. Now it gets a little interesting. Visa, MasterCard, Shopify. We talked about Shopify here. Apple next. Apple is not in the top eight. It's all the way at the bottom here. All right. Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Tenth place is Apple. Only 10% holding. Very few holding Apple. A lot of holding Amazon, very few Apple. But guess what stock pops up right after Apple? Never heard of this stock before. Ticker symbol SE, C Limited. Take a look at this stock. Hmm. This is for SE, SE, C Limited. Now, this is for holdings, okay? So then I went on their top five buys in the last 45 days, all right? And again, things don't look that off. There's nothing crazy surprises, but there's a few huge surprises here. So Amazon, eight out of 20, okay? These are what they're buying in the last 45 days. The, the best performing hedge funds. Guess what the number two stock is? C Limited, four out of 20. Four of the top five funds have this stock, C Limited. Huh. So the next one is Visa, right? And then you got your Netflix, you got your Facebook, you got a couple of other stocks. And we've talked about these, Teladoc, Alphabet. Uh, we talked about Workday. We talked about ServiceNow. We talked about Uber. We talked about Microsoft. We talked about RingCentral. But get, guess this one, the fourth stock, D-Dog. Take a look at this stock, the chart on this stock, D-Dog. These two stocks, C-Limited and Datadog, completely under my radar. <laughs> Some of the strongest stocks being accumulated by the most aggressive hedge funds over the last 45 days. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. D-Dog uh, and SE. Definitely under my radar too. Have not ever heard of those. So that was uh, very informative. Uh, 
I don't know, how about you all online there? Have you heard of those stocks? So great, <laughs> great insight. Thanks for sharing that, Roger. And uh, yeah, um, I hope, uh, I think Adam was typing in all of those symbols there. Um, and just to kind of recap, Roger was talking about the electronic payment stocks. It was uh, uh, ticker symbol COUP and GPN and talked about the uh, three stocks on the chopping block. And those were, those were a, little, a little bit surprising to me also, Roger. Thanks for that insight. Chekopee, uh, CHK, and um, Hertz, HTZ. And there was, there was one other, uh, Nate, you might want to type that one. Play, in. Uh, Dave and Buster's, play. Dave and Buster's, yes. Okay, got that one. And then the small caps uh, uh, Roger was looking at is now, is NOW and E-V-E-R. And then that was great information on the 13F filings. Thanks, Roger. A lot of deep research there with um, S-E and D-D-O-G. And uh, they're asking kind of, where do you find info on stocks that are being accumulated, Roger? Well, there's several places. You can go to a Bloomberg terminal. You could use a database. Um, there's several different places. I, I, use a, I use the Bloomberg terminal for this. I have access, I don't have a full time, I don't need it, but once in a while I do research, I know somebody who has a Bloomberg terminal. I think Jeff, Jeff, don't you have a uh, Bloomberg terminal? Jeff has a Bloomberg, I don't use Jeff's, but maybe- I do, yeah. There we go, oh, yeah. now we know. If a Bloomberg terminal is good, you, there's several, here's the thing. It, the problem is there's so many, when you go to these services, unless you know exactly what you're looking for, to do, you're go it, it's like it's like uh, it, it's like going to a supermarket looking for coffee that you, you know and you've never it's like you get overwhelmed there's just too many things <laughs> so you kind of have to know where you're going before you get there or you're gonna get really really overwhelmed just well that's well said Roger and uh, some of them were asking about the article that I was just talking about if we could send that out and on swing trading so yes we'll just attach that to the email that goes out with the recording of this session. And what Roger is saying, yeah, you gotta know what you're looking at. In fact, that he talks about that in his article. And that's what I appreciate about these guys coming here week after week and sharing their years and years of experience because they're trying to minimize the amount of time that it takes you to learn what they've learned and applied because you really do, you need to, you need to become a master of it, right? You need to understand what you're reading otherwise it's like some others were talking about this morning, having too many indicators on your screen. So well said, thanks as always, Roger. I always love having you on here. And a segue, let's go right into Jeff. Um, and, and Jeff is our you know, global kind of expert. He's around the world, knows a lot that's going on all over the markets and, and watches that. He's talked to us about the dollar. He's talked, you know, talked to us about gold. That was where we first kind of got our introduction down to that. And you know some things that he was even seeing in the market last week that helped traders uh, learn to you know uh, trading on the right side. And so today, what do you have for us, Jeff? What are you seeing going on around the world, and how can we trade that? Well, first of all, hello everybody. Nice to be with you again on Friday. Always hard to follow these great pros. I mean, specifically Roger, who keeps me on my toes. He sent me a uh, message yesterday and he was like, hey man, 13F, 13F. So I was like, oh my gosh, how did I slip on that one? And so boom, I'm on my Bloomberg, check out SC. I look at SC and I'm like, who are these guys? Singapore based company. Fits perfectly into my thesis. So last week I was talking to you guys about the rumblings and the tor turmoil coming between the United States and China. Lo and behold, that was one of the main talking points even today still is the main talking point where we might actually force Chinese companies that raise capital in the United States. There's a couple of big ones that use the U.S. as their main exchange to not be able to do that. We might force them out of the United States. So you've been seeing Chinese stocks in the U.S. get pounded. Alibaba is down 4 or 5% today. Uh, I'm still bearish. I trade with pairs, and I have, uh, I have a money link pair between Amazon and Baba that's been working unbelievable. Amazon's obviously a stock that does nothing but go higher. And Alibaba is a stock that hasn't even seen the possibility and the massive dump that could actually happen. You twist it even more, and there's, there's problems in Hong Kong that are brewing now that aren't even between the, I mean, they're kind of between US and China, but it's really between 
the citizens of Hong Kong who view themselves as an autonomous state, having their own set of rules, their own way of life, and China, who wants Hong Kong to be much more of an outpost now of China. And they're, they're imposing their will on Hong Kong. Hong Kong, for those of you that have been international market observant for a long time, has been the place that Chinese companies raise capital when they're not raising capital in the US. So here they are in a situation where they might not be able to access Western capital pools in the United States. People are starting to really think about fleeing Hong Kong. EWH is also getting crushed today, the Hong Kong ETF. It's down 10% in two days. It's another short that I have. And it hasn't even really hit the fan yet. This is just the beginning of it. People are starting to get in front of these things. And so if you see 25 billion, 30 billion, 200 billion of stock that has to go, CalPERS, California Pension Fund, Fidelity, those guys aren't price agnostic when they have to sell. They just get out. So anybody that's been an institutional trader, you know and I know that when they have to move their size, it goes on and it goes on. And then you'll have these perfect retirement setups from OK, and you'll have these, these, these time trades for Tom. But the institutions, those big fish, those are the guys that are dumping their size to get, to get the, the ocean really rocking and rolling. But I'm not, I'm not all doom and gloom. I have a sector that I really like that has started to flip this week, and it's actually the cannabis space. Now, I know you guys, a lot of you guys are probably old school, and I'm, I'm old school, and you're like, yeah, cannabis, I don't know. But here's the thing. Hear me out. So there's two symbols I want you to, to hear. STZ, which is Constellation Brand. It's actually a liquor distribution company, and there was big news that came out this week. So Constellation Brands, that is the world's number one uh, producer of premium wine and owns all of Corona and Modelo's rights to selling beer in the United States and Canada. They exercised a warrant on a cannabis company called Canopy, uh, Canopy Growth, ticker symbol CGC. Canopy Growth, for me, is like the blue chip. It's like the Coca-Cola of, of cannabis companies. And the reason being is that this huge constellation band, which, which is over 10, 20, $20 billion market cap company, huge alcohol distribution company made 50% investment. They exercised their warrant. It was a huge news in Canopy. So they, they, they exercised the warrant injecting that company with billions of dollars to survive whatever downturn we have. Another aspect that really makes me like this, this stock is that we are going into a deficit and stimulus spending unlike anything we've ever seen before in this country. And we are going to watch as the federal government gets creative, and you've already seen this bid. I don't know, you guys, if you've been following sports gambling stocks, but they've been exploding on the same reason, that you're going to have governments looking for new revenue streams in, tax, in the form of taxation, and cannabis is a really good one. So if and when, and I feel this is inevitable, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, uh, you have a federal legalization for cannabis, you're going to be invested in a company that is going to have the largest liquor distribution company in the country behind them. So CGC, the parent company is STZ, is a little bit safer. It's not as volatile as, as the cannabis company, but I like those. And B, yes, yes, they do. Someone is asking me, does STC also have cannabis infused drinks? They do. Uh, but they're, they're mainly, the way they really make money is selling premium wine and those rights to sell uh, Corona, I hate to say that word, and uh, Modelo in the uh, United States. But Watch this China thing. It's, it's no joke. And though I know there's a lot of people on this panel that are bullish, and I'm bullish too, you have to know where your pain points are and your risk is. A lot of people, and I have friends like this, own some ETFs with Chinese stocks in it, and they don't even realize that those holdings are in those, uh, in those, in those ETFs or in their mutual funds. It's like, wait, what? 20% of my mutual fund are Chinese stocks that are listed in the U.S., and they might get delisted? Yeah. You have to do your homework. You have to follow these things. So, just, just, a, just an FYI, heads up, it, I think it's going to get much crazier before it slows down. I think we've just, we've just, you know, we're just at the tip of the iceberg on that whole story. So I know I talk a little bit fast, but, you know, I drank like 15 Cokes and three coffees in the first hour of homeschooling just to get through it. So sorry, you have to deal. All right. Well, as long as you didn't partake in some of those stocks you just shared with us, so I think we're okay with that. So, no, 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 that no, was- no, 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 no. I like to be up, but I like to make money too. So that's what I'm looking for. 
There you go. With a clear mind. Well, and it reminds me too, you know, we've been doing this for several, several weeks. And one of the things, and I think it was, uh, you know, uh, Roger that was mentioning, you know, you got to learn to play chess in the market and being forward thinking as to what's going to happen next on down the road. And that's really a lot of what I'm hearing from you, Jeff, you know, talking about what's really going on in China, um, how that might impact uh, a variety of things for us here. And then also just forward thinking on the cannabis stocks and, you know, the, the, um, uh, the premium wine, so forth. So I think those are really good insights, you know, write those down and that sticker symbol, what, uh, what was those two sticker symbols again, Jeff? So STZ is Constellation Brands. They're the, uh, the liquor company, distribution company that has 50% ownership in Canopy Growth. So it's STZ. I'll let it right STZ, great. I, think it's I, have, I, have a ver I have a very quick question for Jeff. Didn't, didn't uh, exactly what, what happened here with, with Constellation, what, what we're seeing here, isn't that something that already happened in Canada with, Ultra, with Marlboro and another company, if I'm correct, several months ago or do you know anything about it did, that? But there's, I, I don't follow it as much, but I know that, I know that uh, Altria is, in, is unhappy with how that shook out. So you've seen some weak Altria. So that's, that's funny. That's the stock I'm bearish on actually, Altria, because they're looking for ways to penetrate the cannabis market and they don't really have an entry into it. They're having uh, patent uh, disputes actually right now, which, and they took like a huge blow this week. Uh, I'm no expert, but they're in, they're in deep, they're in a deep situation. And so the same way, Roger, that you look at um, these stocks and say, well, I'm, I, I like this trend, but I want to look for the best in breed. And I know you've been on a lot of like amazing consumer stocks, right? The, the difference between being number one and number two and being like number 10 is the difference between being an actual company and like a Wikipedia historic page where they like, look kids, you know, Atari was really a company just like Sony PlayStation. They made video games. They were amazing. Yeah, bullshit, Dad. I don't believe you. Here, it's on Wikipedia. That's comp there are going to be a lot of companies that are going to come out of 220 like that, hmm. 2020 like that. And you got to be careful. You got to be careful. So. Great. All right. Great information. Thanks for that, Jeff. Thank you. And uh, next you. up, we have Tony. And uh, Tony has been around the markets for a good long time as well. And he's spending this last part of his career into helping all of us as retail traders get the best fills on our trading platform. And, uh, and I think, uh, Tony, you have a couple examples of using some of Tom's trades, how that came together very quickly for, and traders were able to take advantage of a great trading platform, but more importantly, you know, put some of those dollars in the pocketbook. Save That's you some money. We're... That's Sorry, right. That's take right. Away. So Adam um, can tee up. I've got a dozen slides here. I'll go real quickly since it's towards the end of the hour. Um, did a lot of trades in my life, still trade a little on the side, but for the most part, great information from these guys and gals going uh, ahead of me today and from Tom right after. What we do at Trade Direct Pro, uh, we focus on getting those ideas into the market quickly at uh, the lowest price possible and save as much time and dollars so your trades make a lot more sense. Um, we have a uh, full integration with Tom's T-Buzz trade signals. We work hand in glove with his team so that if you're um, one of his subscribers, you'll get, and I'll show you right now what it looked like today, uh, to, two of the trades that he did this week on the platform. You'll get those um, ideas popped in front of you uh, on your system, uh, ready to go to the market. Okay, so for the most part, what you're about to see is um, how Tom sets up his trades. Every Sunday night, he and his team um, put together their plans, and um, he has a text and trade service. We're integrated into that. You can get the roadmap uh, through us also in that, but um, the idea is this week, uh, amongst others, he did a, a trade in GDX. J and XBI, all right? So the first trade in GDXJ, as you can see on the trade window here, might be a little hard for some of you to, to see, but those who um, are part of our Trade Direct Pro family, you can go on TDP chat and um, uh, see this whole presentation. Those who are not, you can hit the 
uh, marketing at uh, tdp.com there. I think um, Celeste or Adam will show it afterwards and we'll get you a login and all of this information is there. So what you get is a order ready to go to the marketplace. As you can see in the green box, it's Tom's signal, uh, the time of the signal, what to do, buy at 6.05 and you can hit send. You don't have to find it on your um, option chain or on your uh, quote uh, system and click it open and tee up a trade. We have a really easy preset for your characteristics characteristics of trading, whether you're a one lot trader, a 10 lot trader, or a 50 lot trader, it's all pre-programmed. Pre you have different uh, tones in your trading. You can flip quickly to whether you're aggressive or less aggressive. So in this case, it pops up by at 605, just hit send. It takes 10 times as long to explain it as it does to actually do it. Then coming out just a short time later after it, GD, XJ rallied, uh, Tom sent a signal to close it out and sell it at 645, pops up. Now, if you don't want to trade it, if you think it's going to extend the move, you can, you can ignore it. Or in this case, uh, we had traders send it to the market and that's all you had to do. And the next one reviews what, what happened. It's a message uh, log that you get it summarizes all the signals, whether you trade against them or not. It's all in the same interface. And to recap this trade, if you're trading 10 lots, you would buy at 605 and sell at 645 for $400 profit, only two clicks. You didn't have to spend a lot of time, risk a fat finger move. The second trade, quite similar, Similarly, this was the XBI trade, came in at um, 402 Eastern, and um, it was a, a order to buy at 1050. And um, once again, one click to send to the market. Shortly thereafter, Tom sent in an order or a signal like four or five minutes later to exit at 1140. So you had 90 cents in there. Okay. The whole signal was less than four minutes. If you are typically looking for the trade, you're going to spend half that time teeing up the order. Summarization there is by the XBI 1753s target of 1140 and uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, currently went in at 1050, target to get out at 1140. And there was the profit of $900. So recapping real quickly, what we do is we work hand in glove with these educators and market analysts to get your trades into the market faster uh, amongst these things that I just showed you today, we also uh, offer the lowest rates for options on the street. And also we have the fastest market data. It's uh, institutional uh, style data, drives your roadmap, no extra charge. So those we've been, we've been um, doing demos of the platform every Friday at 3 p.m. Central. Welcome to have you guys and gals join us this afternoon and we'll walk you through it. Celeste, team, great job. Uh, wish you all a very uh, thoughtful and warm uh, Memorial Day celebration. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks, Tony. That is, you know, that's a game changer for all of us, being able to quickly and easily, uh, you know, click and uh, get that money in our pocket when we're just piggybacking off of the great trade ideas of these moderators here, like Roger or, or Jeff, uh, Tom, Mark Hay, everyone, Martin. So uh, thanks, Tony, for being on with us. I want to encourage everyone to uh, jot down that link and join them. Um, again, game changer. And thanks for those uh, Thank well you. wishes too. So next up, let's talk to Tom and let's find out a little bit more about these trade setups that he has. 
and how he sees the market. So Tom, if you're with us, I know you kind of look at a 24 hour market and uh, you're seeing some things in the middle of the night. Doesn't mean that you have to necessarily be up in the middle of the night, but you're able to see based on some things that you look at what's happening and how that impacts our pocketbook. So if you will, please take it away and share with us. Hey, thanks Les. Tony, are you still here? I am Tom, yes I am. Okay, I want you to watch this, okay? You bet. Jonathan, do the other half of XLK. And I have a half position on of XLK and Jonathan is gonna send out a signal and do that. But anyway, I want you to watch that and time it. Now, secondly, why XLK? When I was listening to Roger and he's a great stock picker, he started naming all these stocks and, and uh, we were, and I said, I said, every one of those stocks uh, that I like are in this XLK ETF. And I said, well, I own half of it. I might as well buy the other half, but no, it's set up. I've been waiting for a number, but it's set up right now. And so that's a good way to play a lot of those good stocks, the uh, tech stocks that are, lead that are leading. So anyway, I wanted to bring that up about XLK. Uh, take it, evaluate it, and it's a, it's a real simple way to get a lot of good stocks. I looked at all of them. And I like everything they've got, their holdings. Secondly, I want to compliment Roger uh, because I've been listening to Roger and I've been writing down his stock picks. And, you know, I like the ideas. And I was so happy that he gave me all these great ideas. And I said, you know, I said, this is pretty good. And so about two weeks ago, I said, for fun, I'll start trading some of Roger's uh, picks. And I've been sending Roger the results. Uh, what do you think, Roger? How good, a, how good is it? You've been killing it, man. You've been doing great job, Tom. Great job. I didn't even know about Logitech until I, I went long and made money on it. But that's just an example. But but I'll do another one this week once I figure it out. I got to go through. Check out, in. when you get a chance, Tom, check out those D-Dog and SE. I wrote them down. They got, they got bold print because I listened to your voice. And Tony knows about this. Jeff knows about this. And yep. uh, anybody's ever been around, you can listen to somebody talk about something and I did it when I was talking to my people on the floor and I could tell if it was a good trade or bad trade just by the words they use. And I've learned that about you, Roger. I can tell you. As a matter of fact, you could subscribe to my service, How to Trade Roger's Picks. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. But no, seriously, great picks that Roger does. I look forward to this in here. And uh, the Bloomberg Terminal, was very interested and Jeff's got one. So I'll be calling Jeff. I got something I want him to look up for me. <laughs> I heard on TV, I want to check out. But anyway, let's talk first about, if we can, about uh, what's about to happen. And I think, I think there's going to be some news over the weekend that accelerates. The match has been lit in China. And because that match has been lit, I think you're going to get a disruption Sunday night. And I think, I think, how do you play that? You got to think that one out because it's going to be short lived because about two o'clock AM to three thirty AM, I got this new term I've coined called uh, Corona put the fed. Okay. is going to step in and they've been stepping in every night between two and three thirty to put support in this market. And I understand their game. I've watched it for years. This is my opinion. So it gives us a downside move that we can buy into because I think the next three days, four days next week are going to be a lot higher than where we are right now. And, you know, when you, when, you know, when you have the buying side and the selling side and you have that institutional support with the uh, sell side sort of being altered, it's going to end up doing what the market's doing right now, climbing up and people go, why is this market up? Earnings are terrible. Unemployment's off the charts. Well, the reason is the actual mechanics of buying and selling has been shifted. And Marty Swag, I know a lot of y'all have heard that name for years ago. I learned when I was a young trader, you don't fight the Fed. And the Fed is, uh, you know, pumping and going right now. And he's got this thing out there. I got this thing out there called the Corona put where he's protecting the downside. So it's going to give us some pretty good action, I believe, over the next few months. 
by playing that. So that is something that uh, next week I'm looking forward to. Okay, and and again, uh, we'll talk more about that on my webinar Monday. But I wanted to take a little bit of time and say, folks, you're so fortunate to have these people. Every one of them are bringing information that is uh, investment grade information. I mean, you just you just look at some of these deals. That GDXJ, I got. I never traded it before, but I actually got it from Marquet's service where she put it out as a recommendation. Now, I've traded it about 11 times since I've uh, found out I like the way it moves, and I'm gonna trade that again. I'm waiting for gold, okay? I'm watching gold today out of the corner of my eye, but I'm waiting for gold to set up. If it goes above 1757.50 on gold, I'm gonna buy GXJ, that's simple. And uh, that's something that, I, that I'll be looking to do uh, to take advantage of what's happening over, over in the Far East, okay? Now, um, when I look at next week and I look at how the setup's gonna be, I think the market, I think people are gonna buy this market. Once the NASDAQ gets above 94.11, uh, you know, you can buy, you, you buy some stocks into next week. I'd buy about half of my normal position because you want to make sure you get through the weekend and then you make sure that you're making money before you add to it on Monday or Tuesday and Wednesday. But I do, I do believe that China is going to get to be a bigger problem as we go into the election. The theme of the election is beat up on China and that's the, the match has been lit and that's going to cause volatility. What are some ways you can play that through the VIX and other things? But I'm just saying, that I see that a general a general climb in the basic market followed by some ups and downs that's going to scare you to death, okay? But uh, remember the corona put uh, as we go further into, into the world. Your typical, oh, this is support uh, or, you know, might not be there. In other words, you might not, not break down is what I'm saying. But other than that, it's a pleasure being with everybody on the panel. Uh, Tony's uh, software, you ought to tune in and find out more about that. Uh, Jonathan uh, has been working with us on that and, and making sure we get the signals out. But I can see, Celeste, we're getting a lot of people on here, and it seems like the word and mouth, you know, word of mouth is growing because I don't think we're generally promoting it much other than the fact that we're going to be here. So if you want us to be back next week, tell somebody, tell them to come uh, and listen. You won't get a better hour spending it with guys like this and girls like this. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, my impression is we get paid by listing and I've been listing today. So thank everybody and y'all have a great Memorial Day and we'll see you on the flip side. All right. Hey everyone. Bye Celeste. Bye Tom. Okay. Bye, bye Tony. Bye. Thanks everyone.